Did you know that they call the pencil moustache the thirsty eyebrow? I've never heard that before. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out why. An eyebrow that's popped down for a drink. <laughs> On. Hello, Zan. Hello, Miff. Good morning. Good, good afternoon. Morning. Good evening. Good. Whenever you're listening to it, really. Good day. Bang on your place, no matter what time of day, for music, art, life, and stuff. Very big week. Very, very big week. I think we should just get you've into had it. A big night, actually. It's not like you've been out all night. Um, because do I look tired? You look like you've been through some stuff, and I, you know, I don't, I don't want to suggest that, but I imagine you have because you, you've been on a roller coaster, a journey. With our favourite gal, Britney Spears. Oh, yeah. Her memoir was released not 36 hours ago. Oof. And I bought it, the audiobook, as narrated by Michelle Williams. And I listened to it all last night and this morning because I wanted to share it with the Bang Fam. I was thinking to Thank myself... Thank you. Thank you for doing that that good work, that good service for the Bang Fam. Well, you're so welcome. Because I didn't do it. I thought... <laughs> Sorry. I thought to myself, oh, I should do this. But as soon as I started reading it, I was in. Mm. It was such a good listen slash read. And I'll say this straight up the front. I know you're someone who likes to, you know, battles with time sometimes, being a bit Mm. time poor or just Mm. like CBF energy if something's too long. This book is five hours, five hours odd for a listen. And if you listen to it at 1.5 speed, as I did, then it's four hours. Knock it off in four. (laughs) That is fantastic. Well, the thing How is, does it sound though with Michelle Williams sort of like a sounding like a chipmunk record? Well, she sounds like Britney because if you think oh. about it, the reason that they probably got not only because she it would have been traumatic for Britney to experience this all, but the way that Britney speaks in if you've heard her now that she's been able to speak over the last couple of years is there's a bit of, there's an energy to it. There's a full on yeah. frenetic energy to it. And I think that hearing that over five hours would probably be a bit intense. So they mm. got Michelle Williams, who is brilliant in this narration role, and telling her story, but she speaks a little bit sort of slower. So up it to one point five and you've got a completely coherent memoir, but sounds more like Britney. Fantastic. <laughs> And I love that energy. Hot tip. Hot, hot tip. tip. Hot tip. So where should we begin? Well, the the book begins, The Woman in Me, that's the title of mm. the book, uh, with The Family Tree. And this is really interesting because there are connections from a very early period to the abusive behaviour on her dad's side. She kind of sets up the family of her dad's side, Jamie Spears, and her mum's side, Lynn Spears. Lynn's mum was British. This is why Brittany loves speaking in an English accent oh, sometimes. Because she feels connected to Lily. I didn't know that either. And this is kind of where it kicks off. And i got to say from pretty much the first page, Jamie Spears is not drawn kindly at all. This was her father who kept her in the conservatorship for 13 years, profited hugely for that. But from the get-go, he's painted as alcoholic, mean, very hard on the kids, Mm. worked them really hard, constantly told them that they weren't good enough, commenting on their appearance, their abilities. One line, and it stood out, she says, I want my dad to stop drinking. I want my mum to stop yelling. I want everyone in my family to be okay. And that feeling of wanting a strong family unit and also pleasing her family is something that runs throughout this whole memoir. And also putting on a front, I would imagine, because of that. Like the whole thing was a show, wasn't it? Absolutely. And the way that these expectations around who she should be, what the family were in the community, and then, of course, how this family was projected to the rest of the world Mm. was super important. Interestingly, on that performance note, she talks about when she performed, that's when she felt most in control because every other part of her life felt out of control, her home life, her personal life, even before she was famous. But when she was a little kid performing, she's like, I can control this environment. This is my space. Mm. This is my domain. And she felt that, which I thought was really fascinating. And, of course, she joined the entertainment industry really early. She was part of the Mickey Mouse Club with... Ryan Gosling. Of course she was. Kerry Russell. Yeah. I forgot. Felicity. Yeah. Um, these were the older kids. Christina Aguilera. Christina Aguilera was, as with Britney, yeah. missed out on the first uh, audition. They weren't quite good enough, but they both went back and got into the Mickey Mouse Club. And, of course, uh, JC Chasse, who joined Justin Timberlake mm. in Sync, And, of course, she was alongside Gosh. JT as well. So much pressure at such a young age. I mean, I was just hoping to get in the netball team. <laughs> And not be wing defence. Like, and here are these kids trying to get into the freaking Mickey Mouse Club. It's full like, on. Uh, to be on TV and to be, like, that's, it's just a bit 
it must have been so bizarre for them. And they were little kids on a sort of... See, this is where she meets JT. Um, they all have this great success on Mickey Mouse Club. A lot of them go on to do other things, films, um, become child actors. But she goes back to Kentwood, to Louisiana, where she grew up. And this is sort of something that I'd forgotten. She didn't just keep going, but she went back, had this normal life. But her normal life was also a little bit skewed because her family life wasn't great. She was drinking by the time she was 13 with her mum. She was smoking with her friends and she was sort of growing up in the best way she could. And then soon after that, she starts thinking, okay, I want to start pitching my music, putting myself out there. Justin and JC have joined boy bands. There's other people in the Mickey Mouse Club who have joined, you know, girl groups. But Brittany and Lynn decide to go the solo route. And this is where they go to New York City. And she starts auditioning with Whitney Houston's I Have Nothing in her auditions. Oh, my goodness. Take my love. Oh. When I heard, I was like, imagine a little Britney singing I Have Nothing. But also how prescient that would have been. Like looking back, she's singing I Have Nothing. Far out. Full on. But also, pretty grown up song <laughs> for a young lady of how old? 14? Not even. It's interesting that you mentioned that because very soon she gets signed she records baby one more time she speaks very highly of working with max martin who's mm. the swedish super producer and writer who helped her you know create that song um but i remember this it was so weird there's a part in the book where she's talking about that famous rolling stone cover which um dave lachapelle mm. shot and it was um Really very Lolita vibes. Yes. I, I was living in America when it came out and it was all the rage and I was dating someone who was seven years older than me, um, which is fine. He was like 19. I was 25, six or seven years older than me. And I remember... You were 19, you mean, and he was 25? Or yeah. He, is that what I said? You said he was 19. No. <laughs> I was going to say, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know after I broke up with him, I flipped that as well and yeah. I became 25 and dated someone who was 19, <laughs> restoring the balance. <laughs> now I just date men my own age. But, yeah, I remember seeing his reaction to it and I was just kind of like, I don't know, it's all these things that we've been talking about recently about how you view women as you're growing up and what you think is okay. And I just remember him saying certain things about that cover and I don't know. She said she really enjoyed it, but it was like she became very very instantly this male Lolita fantasy, mm, didn't she? And she, she was like did. 16 years old. I know. Not okay, everybody. World. is Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, so anyway... Um, then she becomes famous. She becomes one of the biggest artists in the world. There's a lot of intensity in this book and I wanted to say that like throughout it, I did cry on the train on the way into work this morning. You're tired too. <laughs> I'm tired, very tired. <laughs> but it often is happens. Like, it is really beautiful but very tragic but also there's some really funny moments in it too, like the moment she meets Mariah Carey and the way that she described it is I, went in the, I opened the door and there was just this glowing light it was 20 years ago, but Mariah Carey, she knew about ring lights. <laughs> of course she did. Mariah, early adopter of the ring light. Mimi understands her best angle. You know my first experience with the ring light? Yeah. Because it was a big deal. <laughs> Baby's first ring light. It was a big deal because I'd never seen one before either. I feel like Britney. Um, <laughs> I did an interview with Elle McPherson for the project. I think it was for a skincare range. This is probably 10 years ago. And she had a specific light oh and it was a ring light and I'd never seen such a thing. And I was like, I look so beautiful. Well, she looked so beautiful. I mean, she doesn't even need a ring light. At that point, she, there was no need for it, but she still had it. And I remember thinking, gosh, I, the only other person I'd ever heard coming with her own light was jo, Joan Collins. <laughs> But then, then again, I, I think that was an urban myth because they used to say that they'd put Vaseline on the camera for the Joan Collins filter, so it looked a bit fuzzy. So maybe I've just got the two conflated. It's so weird that you're mentioning Joan Collins because when I was in the UK earlier this year shooting a take five, I was being made up by someone who has done Joan oh, Collins' makeup. Joan Collins. And she told me that Joan would come and sort of herself out, but as she got older, she couldn't quite put the eyeliner on as straight. Aww. But she would always need help with putting on the eye, fake eyelashes. And um, because they're hard to put on and then she'd put on like one layer and then she'd say to Kit, the makeup artist, another layer, darling. 
<laughs> and then another layer. Three layers. Three layers, three of, three falsies. layers of falsies. That's a heavy lid. This is the good shit you get from makeup artists. That is a heavy, <laughs> heavy lid. Wow. So anyway, back to Brittany. She felt that backlash from Day Dot, that f- sort of, you know, the firing of inauthenticity that was blasted at her. But in her words, and I love this, she was just a teenage girl who signed her name with a heart. Who were they expecting? Bob Dylan? <laughs> just this constant undermining of pop artists of who you should be, do yeah. you write your own songs, oh, also, all of that bullshit. Yeah, yeah, questioning women, particularly of their authorship and their authenticity. It's I think that's been thrown at women since, creative women since the beginning of time. Yeah, and also how they should behave. You know, mm. she broke up with Justin Timberlake. There was different sides of that story. Justin Timberlake wrote Cry Me a River and cast an actor that looked just like Britney Spears in that. And she was absolutely raked over the coals for that. But as she says, you know, there's always been more leeway in Hollywood for men than women. And the thought of my betraying him gave his album more angst, gave it more of a purpose. Shit-talking an unfaithful woman was all the rage at the time. Mm. I felt really, like, taken back to those moments again, just thinking of the the late 90s, all the sort of... That lad culture that we've talked about recently with Russell Brand, but also just that internalised misogyny in the way that in, I know it's a long time ago now, but it still feels like so recent a past that all Mm. of this bullshit was going on. And she was living it, you know. She says, I don't think he realises the power he had and I don't think he realises to this day. Justin Timberlake gets a fair serve in this. It's not cruel. It's not mean. It's just straight up. And I... I'll be really interested to see whether or not he responds to this. I don't reckon he will. I don't think he will. Um, but she seems like she was just really disappointed, like heartbroken but then just disappointed in the way that it's panned out and, of course, how the media covered it. Another fun fact, she once lived in the four-storey NoHo apartment that Cher used to live in. Oh, wow. Yep. Were they mates? No, she just moved into her place in New York. But she was so busy and anxious about sort of going outside because there was so much paparazzi that she barely got to live her New York City life. And this is something that becomes very obvious as well. She's just constantly hounded. When she meets Madonna for the first time, she observes how much Madge commanded and demanded power. And she gave her lots of advice, including lots of um, talk about Kabbalah. Remember the Kabbalah era of Madge? Yes. It's like going in a time warp in this, this book. Um, And there's this line at the end of Chapter 19 which really stuck with me. At what point did I promise to stay 17 for the rest of my life? Yeah. Expectations. That split with Justin and then the divorce with Kevin Federline. Federline? No one needs to know. That dickhead made her (laughs) distrust everyone. She says she didn't know how to play the game and they played her. And this is the beginning of a lifetime of betrayal by mainly men, uh, a lot of them in her family. And, uh, the worst she, betrayal by her father. Yeah. And she just feels like she's confused and doesn't know how to trust people, which you realise explains a lot of the behaviour, that fear. You know, she's a deer in the headlights for a good reason. Mm. She also acknowledges, which I appreciate, that she never knew how to dress and still doesn't. <laughs> it's good. It's a good thing that hipster <laughs> pants have come back. That's all I'm going to say. It's is, so low. It's, Every time I see her dancing with the low, I'm like, you've definitely, you're waxing every day at this point. You've well, got to be. Oh, look, she's she's, La- it's she's all literally <laughs> nucleared the hair there, I think. there's That is never coming back. Which is fine. Which is fine. Whatever. Do, it's her choice. That's exactly right. But, yes, it ta- that would have taken a lot of yeah work. I don't want to read too many quotes out from this book, but I do want to read this one because it really just it stopped me in my tracks. Um, the setup for this moment was around the time where she shaved her head. She's in a custody battle at this point. And this is, again, like I think that we remember these little glimpses of quote-unquote pop culture and history in isolation. But the context is Kevin hasn't let her see her children in weeks. The youngest of her children is five months old. That's it's a awful. That's a baby. And she's trying to see her kids. She's gone to his house and begged to see them, but he's not letting her in. And this is what she says. I wanted to get a battering ram to get to them. I didn't know what to do. The paparazzi watched it all happen. I can't describe the humiliation I felt. I was cornered. I was out being chased, like always, by these men waiting for me to do something they could photograph. And so that night I gave them some material. I went into a hair salon and I took the clippers and I shaved off all my hair. Everyone thought it was hilarious. Look at how crazy she is. Even my parents acted embarrassed by me. But nobody seemed to understand that I was simply out of my mind with grief. 
My children had been taken away from me. With my head shaved, everyone was scared of me, even my mum. No one would talk to me anymore because I was too ugly. My long hair was a big part of what people liked. I knew that. I knew a lot of guys thought long hair was hot. Shaving my head was a way of saying to the world, F*** you. You know what you want me to be pretty for you? F*** you. You want me to be good for you? F*** you. You want me to be your dream girl? F*** you. I'd been the good girl for years. I'd smiled politely while TV hosts leered at my breasts. While American parents said I was destroying their children by wearing a crop top. While executives patted my hand condescendingly and second-guessed my career choices, even though I'd sold millions of records. While my family acted like I was evil and I was tired of it, at the end of the day, I didn't care. All I wanted to see was my boys. Oh, poor thing. You just, like, we just let everyone treat her like shit for so long. Yeah. And wondered why she acted that way. Mm. It's just insane. It's like so, paparazzi are hounding you and, and knocking on the door. How do you feel? Are you missing your kids? Just like, eh, eh, eh. Yeah. Oh. Just poking the beehive. Absolutely. But and it was wondering okay, what but happens it was, when, it bur- when it bursts. It's, but it was okay to do because apparently she and superstars like her are public property. Yeah. And always have been. I think it's changing, but it's it's awful. It's an awful way to live. And those people that make their money off that, no. Nah. Well, Jamie Spears made a lot of money off that because soon after he put her into a conservatorship, all of her behaviour was something that he justified to put her in this for 13 years. Mm. There's a moment in the book where, as it's beginning, her father sets up an office in her house and says, I'm Britney Spears oh. now. Ugh. Gross. Gross. So um, is it good? Would you read it? Like when I mean, obviously it's I full it. on and it's, it's powerful, on. but it's is it is it a good read? It's a fantastic read. It's it's not just her reclaiming her story. This is why people are so interested in it and why we're talking about it because everyone else has been controlling her narrative, which you feel this keenly mm. for decades. But she's also reclaiming her very sense of self through this book, and it's beautifully written. Um, she. You really get a sense of how much she loves her children and I really felt keenly how much of her life she didn't get to spend and their childhood she didn't get to spend with them. It's mm. just devastating. She was taken away from that experience of being a mother. Yeah. Um, and th- there's a line in it where she says at the end, don't underestimate your power. She's empowered by the Free Britney movement. She's told about it through a nurse in the institution that she's been put in who basically says, hey, Look at what's happening outside. There's people mm. fighting for you, which is incredible. Mm. And that gives her power and she got out of it. And I just, th- reading through this whole thing, I was like, you're, you're so strong. You survived all of this. Mm. So strong. In 2023, though, think about that. That's what freaked me out. She's talking about being in lockdown and COVID and she's still in it. This is really recent. Yeah. Like, I know that everything, time is a blur, but I'm just, it just reminded me of like, she just got out of this. Yeah. We talk about it now as like it's a normal thing. She's been on Instagram dancing and playing with knives and all that kind of stuff yeah. for ages. But it's very recent. She only got out of this in the last two years. Yep. How um, did that happen in this day and age? How did it happen? No. Anyway, highly recommend. I think that, that it's not credited, but I think that it was written with a ghostwriter. Um, some people say Sam Lansky is a music journalist and an author of memoir and novels. But the way that they have together captured Britney's voice is just so perfect. It feels very authentic, for lack of a better word, and beautifully done, and I highly recommend it. Five hours. Five stars, five hours. Four hours on (laughs) 1.5. Do yourself a favour. I loved it. Good. I loved it. It wasn't work, and it empowered me. Yeah. (sighs) All right, now you should go home and have a sleep, I think. (laughs) But now I'm I did just justify 20 minutes of bang on because I spent the last six hours or of the last 24 okay, hours. We've only got three ready. minutes per every other story now, so um, let's go. Oh, my God, big news for Beyonce fans this week. Did you know it's 10 years since she was in Brunswick? I loved it when she was in Brunswick. I was living in Brunswick at the time. Where were you when Beyonce stood out the front of a crappy old house in the back streets of Brunswick and raised the property prices in one 
one hour. Where were you, Zan? Bath Street, apparently it was. I <laughs> yes. had to Google it. Yes. Um, and she was hanging out with a, a canine, appears to be a boxer. It was for the visual album and this song in particular. No, I'm not an angel either, but at least I'm trying. I know I drive you crazy, but would you rather that I be a machine? Most of the video was actually shot in the States, but... For some reason, while she was on, must have been the last time she was on tour here. Yeah, it was. Which, frankly, is a long time, it babe. Is a long Come time back ago. to Australia, 10 years. That's correct. And captured a couple of moments, not just in front of this old house, but also at a little um, service station called Little Sam's, which is in the area too. Oh, yeah. One of the last surviving uh, independent Ooh. service stations. So it's got no branding or anything, and she's there filling up her, her car. Did she go on to have a suva <laughs> at A1 Bakery? Apparently, she went to the Retreat Hotel. I'll get out, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Which, of if you course. know, if you, anyone is in Melbourne, re- retreats a you know classic, legendary pub with a big beer garden. I just love the idea that she's you know sinking a pot in the Having back a of the retreat. Would she have a pot or a pint? <laughs> I should have a pint. Yeah, she would. Wouldn't big she? day filming. That's One of my right. favourite stories around this was that the owner, the elderly owner of the house, um, mm. who had no idea what was happening, was paid first of all three hundred dollars, and I'll say that's how the rich stay rich. Three hundred bucks for a location. Bit tight, Beyonce. Could Bit tight, Beyonce. Some more, given the state of that house. <laughs> But she heard when someone knocked on her door and said, oh, hey, do you mind if we use your Mm. exterior for a shoot? She thought that they were asking to um, shoot some pictures for their fiancé, not for Beyonce. Bless. (laughs) Bless. Hey, do you think that's why Brunswick, or at least East Brunswick, has become uh, one of the greatest (laughs) suburbs in the world? It's in the top ten. Do you think that had anything to do with Beyonce (laughs) being on the porch? She was ahead of the curve. Of a nonna's house. Ten years ago, she's like, Brunswick, I'm going to give you a leg up. (laughs) I'm going to hang out at a decrepit house, which has now been All done up. All done up. Looks so bland now. Yeah. There's no life to it. Beyonce wouldn't be back. Um, seems like she was celebrating, though, this week her visit to Brunswick by releasing a fancy perfume. Well, yeah. Were the two tied? I think so. <laughs> Ten-year anniversary when I was in Brunswick. Let's release some C'est Noir. C'est Noir, that's right. And her tagline, C'est Noir, say no more. I don't quite get that, but anyway. That it, look, it, whatever makes you happy, Beyonce, people are going to buy it. Top, top notes of clementine and golden honey. Heart notes. What's a heart note of rose, absolute, and jasmine sambuck, and base notes of what are the, Namibian what are, myrrh and what are gold the shoe amber. notes? <laughs> the toenail notes. What are the heel notes? <laughs> well, she has been wearing it apparently, just spraying herself while in the middle of her show. I think she's confused. She knows it with how deodorant. to sell, doesn't she's she? Confused <laughs> it with deodorant. Have you ever put on perfume, expensive perfume as deodorant because yeah. you haven't been able to find any? Yeah. I'm always like, I'm actually, what's it doing to Have my pores? Have you ever pores? put dry shampoo on instead of deodorant? <laughs> yes. Yes, and the other way round. This is not her first perfume. It's not? No, you would have seen them they, in a certain large um, industrial size chemist retailer. The previous perfumes are called Rise, Heat and Pulse. See, I always think they're knockoffs in those chemists. Because they look so shit. they just look so dodgy and there's walls and walls of them and I'm like, surely these can't be real. I don't reckon she's going to release this one in chemists. I think this it's 160 US. Okay. And you've got to order it directly from her website. I don't think this it's is. Gonna, I don't think this is going to be <laughs> it's a chain chemist. It's perfume. fancy. <laughs> it's fancy. It's Senoir. It's French Senoir. now. Sen- Senoir. Um, good for you, Beyonce. Also working on a hair care line. I hear. Good to know. Yep. <laughs> good to know. We'll buy, of course. Speaking of really rich people. Yeah, Why am I playing Kings of Leon? <laughs> well, not? well, because you love them. Um, no, uh, there's been a beautiful blog post this week that absolutely rags on Kings of Leon. And it's it's kind of beautiful because it talks about a certain level of artist in the music business of a certain age and they're still quibbling. I love it as if it's, you know, 2002 and that they're all at the top of their game. They're not. <laughs> And I'm talking about Kings of Leon and Andy Cato from Groove Armada who performed together at the V Festival in Chelmsford in the UK and uh, he's written a a rather delightful and very, very entertaining blog post and he's writing a blog too. (laughs) I, I just love it. It's like 2003 is here with us because the lineup of this festival is great. Paul Weller, Kasabian, Florence and the Machine, Stereophonics, Groove Armada of course and then... The headliners, 
Kings of Leon, or are they headliners? I don't know. On a bill like that, you could pick any of those and they could be headliners. They feel like headliners, don't they? They do. In their own lunchbox. They do. They do. And apparently Kings of Leon put on utterly presidential shenanigans as they not only drove in to the backstage area by having, you know, all these black cars with security around them as if they were... The full, like, tinted window Joe SUV. Biden, yeah. Joe Biden <laughs> turning up. But they also required, or so is it the word sequestered when you take it for yourself, a uh, half of the backstage dunnies and showers, <laughs> apparently just for them. And <laughs> this blog post... How is, much poo have they got to do? Exactly. I mean, I mean maybe their bums were on fire or something. I don't know. Um, but I love this because this is what Andy Cato wrote and it's hilarious. He's gone, a couple of us found a gap in the barrier of the toilets that had been blocked off. Out of nowhere came a very large man. Reserved for Kings of Leon, he said, and so is this half of the artist's toilets. And then he's gone on to write, it's hard to believe that someone actually phoned their agent and said, listen, I know that Paul Weller, Kasabian, Florence, Stereophonics, Groove Armada and Co are all sharing the artist village and facilities, but we require that you put a fence down the middle of the toilets and showers and put a large man there to keep them just for us. But somebody did. I mean, really, what damage is Paul Weller going to do if he goes into a cubicle next to you while you're having a poo? Not much. Not much, mate. Sing you a song maybe? Mate, I mean, that Help would be quite along. pleasant. Yes. They also turned up four Wild minutes wood. before they were getting on stage. You could sing a bit of Wildwood to make it, <laughs> make it flow a little bit better. <laughs> Groove Armada would be great. I see you, baby. Shaking that ass. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't even use them. Turned up four minutes didn't beforehand. Didn't even use them. Oh, he's gone on to say... The promoter came over, smoothed it over and apologised. Bearing in mind that this was all happening backstage in the area shared by all the bands, it's hard to see what the Kings thought they were protecting themselves from. Was Paul Weller going to hound them for autographs? <laughs> was Florence going to wrestle them to the ground? Or maybe Stereophonics were going to ask them to write Your Sex is on Fire on an album sleeve? <laughs> None of this is going to happen, Kings of Leon. They were the heroes of backstage, though, weren't they, for approaching them? The blog post is quite uh, lengthy. I think that at the end they end leaving the venue and driving out and they're told to pull over on the side of the road, again, very presidential, <laughs> so that the Kings of Leon can pass. So they jump out of the car and basically flip them the bird. When did their career escalate so much that they got a police escort? It's wild. No one cares. No. No one cares. Uh, the people backstage, the other artists, reportedly landed three cases of champagne on Groove Armada's um, <laughs> backstage rider to say thank you for calling out the bullshit. I love that. So, so silly. Speaking of weird music things this week. How's this for a headline? Kurt Cobain and Courtney Love's daughter marries Tony Hawk's son in a ceremony officiated by Michael Stipe. Of course. (laughs) We don't actually need to give any more details. That's it. Are we we living like in the late 90s, early 90s? It's bizarre, isn't it? Francis Bean Cobain has... Uh, married Riley Hawk. Mm. Her godfather is Michael Stipe. That's the oh, right. okay. context, which I love, and apparently he's beautiful. And Courtney Love has had her ups and downs. I think having someone steady like Michael Stipe has been very good for her. I know them personally, so I can offer of this course, opinion. Of course, of course, of <laughs> course. Um, well, that's nice. They've found happiness. I feel like this is one of those cases where actors marry actors and famous kids of 90s people marry other famous kids because no one else understands that experience, right? Oh, it's just, your, it's just your people, though. That's who you hang out with. True. It's all normal. It's like the Mickey Mouse Club. Totally. They all end up Which was not one normal another. and not okay. <laughs> anyway, that gave me joy seeing that headline. Yeah. Something that didn't bring me joy this week was you sending me an article that the goatee is back. What is wrong with you? What is actually wrong with you? Save some for later. That is <laughs> flavour saver. Oh, it's, so <laughs> it's the worst, it's so isn't it? Gross. It is the worst. Jack White's sporting a goatee at the moment, and it's like he's gone through a lot of different looks. This is absolutely the bottom of the barrel for him. Yeah, Why? it is. It is. Yeah, apparently, uh, Blenthianga have um, <laughs> uh, sent four models down with goatee beards. Um, and you did mention that older gentlemen do like to sport a goatee, mm. i.e., Jack White. It, it is. 
It is a great thing actually for covering up a loss of a chin, a, a weaker jaw, mm. and a and a, a jaw a chin that's sort of a bit like mine turning into two or three. <laughs> so that is the the first stop for a younger gentleman who hasn't gone full beard yet. Mm. Who or sorry, I should say middle aged gentleman who hasn't mm. gone full beard yet. So very popular, never went away with that lot. Um, but apparently the younger folk are in. Uh, what anything Y two K. As we said, are we in 2003? I think Cargo we might pants be. and goatees, what's happening? It's awful. Learn from our mistakes. It's awful. It's awful. Um, apparently in football, the Premier League, there's something like uh, Football of Fits, uh, an Instagram account, which I've never looked at, but I will now, a goatee fixation on there, which has 543,000 followers. So that's happening. It's back. Like, I, th- I think we just have to accept it. Shannon Noll was right. <laughs> The flavour saver will never disappear and I just think we need to just embrace this. Um, we've embraced the pencil mus- moustache, which you know what they call you this? You always call on Nolsey for the most key points in yeah. Bang On, don't well, you? He, he he was one of the early adopters, I think, back in the day. Um, did you know that they call the pencil moustache the thirsty eyebrow? I've never heard that before. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out why. An eyebrow that's popped down for a drink. <laughs> Yeah, I know. We're in such a lovely time, aren't we? We really are. We don't know who we are. We're lost. We're flailing. (laughs) We're going back to the 2000s. Um, uh, Look, it's fine. Not sure it's it's sanitary, but it's fine. (laughs) All right. Let's come back to 2023 and talk about AI. Whoa, we're back in 2023. Oh, my God, really? (laughs) How did we get there? I feel lost. You sent me a great article this week about uh, average city images. I hated this so much. I hated I that you send... sent me a Daily Mail article. I, I got know. so many pop-ups. Uh, it's just, I'm trying to look at it now and everything's just pinging all over the website and I can't, I can't even find a story. It's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. No, what's happened is somebody's done a what would every person in – what would an, an average person look like in various capital cities and regional cities in Australia? They've mm. popped it into AI and they've come out with some horrific pics. <laughs> First one, Sydney. Sydney guy is uh, having a – looks like a large coffee in front of the Sydney Harbour Bridge in the Opera House. He just looks fairly – Fairly reasonable, but, you know, quite good looking, wearing very trendy sunglasses. Middle class hipster vibes. Yeah. And the Sydney woman is basically going through some sort of, like, tornado with her hair. She looks quite stylish. And <laughs> well, she's down by the harbour. Down by the harbour, of course. I mean, that's the only thing people in Sydney do is mm. go to the Sydney Harbour Bridge and the Opera House. That's right. <laughs> so, I mean, it seems pretty apt. She's she's quite fashionable. That's lovely. Love her blazer. Yeah. Melbourne guy kind of looks like Melbourne guy. I'm really anti his dirty denim jacket, though, because no one in Melbourne has worn dirty denim since 2003. So I find this highly unacceptable and offensive. Also, I think that the scarf that he's wearing is very Byron Bay slash Brunswick Share House. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's it, it stinks of patchouli from here. <laughs> and Melbourne woman is an older woman because there's a lot of us here. And she, this is where we all are, that's, according to song. That's right. She's also wearing, well, she's not wearing sunglasses. She's wearing transition lenses. Mm-hmm. And that seems unfair but true. Um, <laughs> and some sort of tie-dye, splattered, coloured outfit. That's fine. Look, I'm, I'm happy with Melbourne lady, but it just kind of gets worse and worse from here. Brisbane typical woman is just, I don't know where they got her from. She's just boring. and The Darwin man looks like a recreation from, you know, that painting, um, who's it, uh, Frederick McCubbin, the painter, the oh. the pioneer, the three panelled totally. painting. Yeah. That's what Darwin Man looks like. Darwin Man looks like. I mean, if that's what they think Darwin is, <laughs> they've got it wrong because Darwin is very different to that. And also, Adelaide Man. It's Gold Rush. Might as well be somebody in. Uh, what, what, like a gold rush drama. He's panning for gold. Totally. So is the woman. It's like, am, it's, I, am I in Sovereign Hill right now? So Like, why is Adelaide these are 200 s- years behind us? They, Perth is disgraceful. Uh, Perth is just a hipster holding a beer. The Gold Coast guy looks like he might shiv you at any point. 
<laughs> he's going to attack you in a dark alleyway, that's for sure. Geelong man looks like he's having an existential crisis. Oh, where's Geelong man? I can't remember. Because he's by him. the beach, but he's very windswept and quite oh, cold. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, that would make sense. Um, Cairns woman looks like she's in a still life portrait. So I don't know what on earth was going on with that. But what it's pointed up, and I found another article this week just by coincidence, and it was a, an excellent little article about... Um, well, it's basically about AI having a hotness problem. Mm. Everybody in these photos, you know, while they looked a little different, they're just too too good looking. They're all hot. They're all hot. Their facial structures are beautiful. You know, no, Symmetry, all of it. Yeah, all of it, all of it. And this article that's come out in the Atlantic this week is AI has a hotness problem. I'm like, bang, there you go. That's why I hate it. And it's by Carol, Caroline Mims Nice. And she said... In the world of generated imagery, you're either drop-dead gorgeous or a wrinkled, bug-eyed freak. (laughs) There is no in-between. And uh, she comes up with a couple of theories, and they're really interesting, actually. The first one is that um, AI tends to put in, well, when you put a whole lot of hot together or a whole lot of sort of general, the best photos you can possibly get, then the only way it's going to come out is that the images that AI will choose. What goes in comes out. Exactly. That's how you make the sausage. And it depends on who puts the photos in as well. I mean, that's the thing. We don't know who's putting all this stuff into AI. Well, Just it comes in a lot of different ways as well. And even if you think about the way that the internet skims images, what are the images that you put on your social media? The ones where you look the best, right? It's mostly. Then I put some terrible <laughs> ones up just for fun. But this is what main, most of us do. We want to present well. So the things that we're putting out publicly, i.e. the things that are freely available, mm. are the best versions of ourselves, which creates um, a bias and a recreation of an average of, of hot. And even mm. if it's just we're not that hot, basically it averages out to make us look a whole lot better. Yeah. But it messes with people, doesn't it? Because like we've seen with people doing having fillers and having other things, um, you know, plastic surgery and stuff to change their face, it's that Instagram face, mm. uh, people then start thinking that that's normal, that's what yeah. we expect and that's, and that's, what that's we should increase. look like. Yeah, totally. And it's not true. But it's interesting too, things like in AI, if the photos that they've put through are through advertising images and, you know, people posing, quite often there's even things like the way the characters that they've created hold their hands they do that because so many of the images that they've got in their whatever their search engine is is people modeling a watch and there's oh. a certain way of putting your hands that looks aesthetically attractive that's so wild. that's so there's all these other things into play it's not just the person that looks like that it's how they hold their body yeah. and that's why they're coming out kind of hot and they also say that midpoint hottie too if there is an image generating tool ends up generating more attractive faces as an accidental byproduct of how they analyse the photos that go into them in that, it, like, I think if you get a whole lot of pretty good, it actually creates something rather, like, considered beautiful. Yeah. So it's it's kind of evil and kind of fascinating. It takes a lot of correction as well to kind of balance that out, I think, to, for it to reflect real life and it's a matter of, like, whether people have the... Um, motivation, whether it's financial or otherwise, to be mm. able to make those corrections. But I, I, AI is so fascinating. It's already here. It's in us. It's in the world. Mm. But as we see that, it's kind of, yeah, it was really, um, I don't know, like light bulb moment like me when I was like, when you said that, I was like, oh, yeah, they're all hot. Yeah. Or like even even the sort of, you know, freaky AI pictures, they're still kind of hot. Still hot. <laughs> and that's why people are putting them up. You know, like some people have already, like on your social media, they've they've gone through and gone, oh, look, lol, isn't this funny, me and AI? And I'm going, no, that looks hot. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Amazing. Uh, We're about to get into our bang on, but before we do, I just wanted to read something from the bang box from a long-time listener, first-time bang backer. says, G'day, Miff and Zan. Please reject the dull and dreary dugong as the mascot for the Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games. We were talking about dugongs last week. Reject is harsh. How boring are they? Oh, ouch. Says Matt. Have you seen the dugong from the Morton Island Ferry? Absolute yawn. There's a reason there's no dugong watching industry up here. He goes in. I'm starting the campaign for Betty and Barry the Bull Sharks to be the face. And more importantly, the teeth of the games. Oh. Bull Sharks are the main predator. 
in the, in the Brisbane <laughs> River. They're in all the other canals and rivers of the Sunshine and Gold, Gold Coasts. They much better represent our region and are way more fun than dugongs. Adding some bull sharks, sharks will also add a lot more viewer interest for such boring sports as marathon swimming, <laughs> rowing and canoeing because you could die by doing them. Exactly. Sharks would make the wrestling and judo way more watchable too. Say yes to ba- Betty and Barry the bull sharks. We all want it says Matt, and my favourite bit is the PS, no, I'm not a marine biologist. Oh, sorry then, you, you, your opinion is not valid if that's not the case. We only take the opinion of marine biologists when it comes to our, our sea life. But no, thank you for that. I do appreciate that. That's a great idea. It's on par with PS, I love Pilates. I yeah. Think. <laughs> love Pilates. Love Pilates. Thank you, Matt. Thank you to everyone who emails us in the bang box. We appreciate it. A lot of people have been making use of that easy Mm. to uh, contact us button on the ABC Listen app as well. Yeah, very nice. um, Yeah, I'll forward you those. I don't know where that button is. (laughs) Never looked. Um, Hey, but we did get a recommendation for a documentary that I've heard about heaps and I really, really wanted to watch it, but I'd forgotten... It kind of existed so until life, isn't it? Until we got reminded, yeah. and, and this is why we bang on about things. So I thought I will bang on about that because I got recommended by one of the Bang Fam, and it's amazing. It is the uh, Nan Golden documentary, All the Beauty and Bloodshed. Oh, yeah. Remind anyone who doesn't know, who mm. is Nan Golden? Why has this doco been made? Well, Nan Golden is a photographer, and she's been taking photos since uh, the 70s in America of everyday life of her own, of the people around her, uh, a lot of... Um, a um, lot of minorities, more subversive culture, really, really interesting stuff, very graphic stuff a lot of the time. She was and is an amazing photographer. At the time, you know, not again, when we look back at history, a lot of the major galleries were saying, you know, that's not important enough. What you do is of the everyday, it's not important And in actual fact, it's some of the most important stuff that we have Mm. now because it documents a time, it documents a community, a culture uh, and the the gay and trans community that she lived with that were very much a part of her life, the devastation of AIDS, that entire time has been documented. And she's made a documentary or at least a documentary has been made about her but obviously with her consent because it's um, about her experience. She found herself addicted to opioids after having a wrist operation, uh, OxyContin, in fact. Mm. And if anyone knows anything about OxyContin, you've watched quite a few of those TV series. Mm. It's it's very much a a thing people are talking about at the moment. OxyContin was marketed to pretty much huge, the, the entire country, in particular lower socioeconomic areas, where people got hooked, got addicted and died. Like half a million people have died because of OxyContin and she nearly died herself. She overdosed. And interestingly enough, the family behind OxyContin or the company, Purdue, I think it was called, uh, are the Sacklers. Now, the Sacklers are a family who have basically laundered their reputation through art galleries, art galleries in which Nan Golden is heavily represented, some of the biggest in the world, the Guggenheim, the Met, the Louvre, all of them. And it is a documentary about her protesting within these spaces, the the Sackler galleries, they're all and that they're all in, in all of these institutions and universities, uh, which makes the Sacklers look like a nice, decent family, which they're not. Uh, and over a period of years she manages to get these names removed because of the protest and also possibly puts herself in a situation whereby her art is no longer deemed valuable within mm. those institutions because she's actually showing them who they are mm. and where they get their money. It is it is a fabulous documentary. It's it's really, really worthwhile. So How did you watch it? Where is it? It's on Stan. Oh, great. Yeah, super, super easy. Um, I just wanted to do a quick shout out to, to the um, oh, Shalila Medora. She recommended these beautiful birds that I wasn't aware of. I have a new live feed. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very excited to get right in. And these little birdies, I'm just going to get the details for them. Um, the osprey chicks in South Australia, just off Port Lincoln, apparently they haven't had any babies for years and years and years because the foxes have been swimming over to the island on which they breed and stealing the babies. Mm. And uh, the locals finally worked it out and put their little nests up on stilts essentially and we have two we have two we have a live stream i'm in there (laughs) thank you so much shalala i appreciate you super happy 
Wouldn't be bang on without some bird talk, would totally, it? Totally, totally. I love that, just squeezing in at the end. Yeah, just dropping that in. Uh, look, I think there's going to be a bird reference pretty much every week from here on in. <laughs> um, the Crowley Falcons, Peregrine Falcons are doing well too. They've had two babies. Are they our Perth friends? They're our Perth friends. Excellent. Get, get on them on Instagram. Thank you, Bang Fam. Always yeah. looking out for us. <laughs> love it. What are you banging on about? Uh, well, I was going to bang on about the Britney Spears memoir, but I feel like we spoke about that quite a lot. Um, I will say definitely read it. It's a cracking read. But I'm also banging on about another book by one of our favourite writers, Bridget Delaney, Well Mania, which is, if it sounds familiar, the book that inspired the TV series mm. starring Celeste Barber, which you've banged on about before. Yeah. Benjamin Law translated it to the screen, and I'll say that because it's not what you saw on Netflix. It's actually... Bridget's own experiences um, and not so narrative as the yeah, series it's not is. A, it's not a drama necessarily. It's her going out to experience. Yeah. All Have of you read things. it? No, I haven't actually, weirdly. Oh, it just reminded me of how much I love her writing yeah. and also how much I love a very real person diving into this world of wellness. So all the trends that you think about, cold press juices, hot yoga, quitting sugar, paleo, mindfulness, religion, everything, um, detoxes, all of it. She sort of goes and gives herself over as a guinea pig. She's a journalist who reviews a lot of these things for various publications around the world, but really dissects why we do this, why we're striving for this, and also where she's at. And on a very basic level, I love reading her writing, but also I'm currently doing um, a pottery course Aww. every Monday night, and it's there's nothing better. Oh, my. <laughs> It's not as sexy as you think. My darling, you and Jeffy on the wheel. <laughs> I'm doing it by myself. I'm, so, I'm making friends. I'm hungry for your you know how people talk about putting Hello. their lonely times and time. <laughs> I'll let, you, I'll let you have it now. That's good. Sorry. I'll enjoy that. You know when people talk about like locking their phone in a drawer because mm. they're so addicted to it that they need to break that addiction? This is weirdly kind of similar because I just put my phone away, put it on Do Not Disturb. The class goes for two and a half hours. It goes by in an instant and I've got my hands on the wheel covered in, you know, gunk in mm. clay and I don't get up and check my phone. I'm just in it and mm. I also, much like Bridget talks about in her book, she goes to yoga for months on end and kind of never gets good at it. And I find that so great because people always you talk about the You don't. Good. It's you about the process. Have you, made, be in it. have you made a bong or an ashtray yet? Because <laughs> that was the only thing you ever wanted to make when you are in high school. This is the point. I'm just working out how to make an basic pots. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm doing the basic, I'm getting the wheel, which if anybody's ever done pot pottery is incredibly phallic, just guiding it up and basically looking like mm. you're giving someone a handy. And then you finger it with your thumb. <laughs> yep. It's so phallic. We know about that. But, the, but I'm just trying to master that and being in the moment and enjoying that and then I mess it up and then I scrape it off and I start again. Mm. And I love doing that. It is such great mindfulness, but also I just enjoy switching off. So I really, really related to this book in that way. And it's just really funny and brilliant. It came out a few years ago. It got turned into a TV series, but in case you missed it, and I know that I've banged on about Bridget's book about stoicism, oh, yeah. Yeah. well mania. It's just great. I love everything she does. And I hope she's writing a new book. I'm sure she is, mm. but she's just such a great writer. Yeah. The best. Um, will I get a pot for Christmas, please? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very you'll much. You'll get some real wonky ones. <laughs> the base will be cracked. Uh, one side will be thicker than the other. Have you had the anxiety of putting it in the kiln? Well, yet? no, I've just been haven't. I've just been drying them and then trimming the pots and then we'll kiln it. And then, It's a very slow process. Mm, yeah. <laughs> slow it right down. Right down. Like Britney Spears' memoir, slow it right down. Yeah. Or put it on 1.5 speed and it'll yeah, just get sound it like done. Britney. Get it done. Ooh, what a week. What a week, hey? See you next week. Yeah, absolutely. Bye, Bye. babes. Bang. 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 Bang on.